Hello, I'm Ben Tuman, and welcome back to Skipped History. The weather may be hot, but this season will be even hotter. Still got it! Today's story is the first of two parts about the Attica prison uprising of 1971. I read about it in Blood in the Water by Heather Ann Thompson. Let's jump right in to prisons. With over 2 million people incarcerated today, the U.S. has the largest prison population in the world. But it wasn't always so big. In fact, the prison population only began to spike in the early 1970s. Why? Well, there are a number of answers to this question, and we've explored one or two before. But over the course of this two-part series, I'd like to zoom in on a particularly shocking explanation. Attica. Located in upstate New York, Attica is a typical small town until you drive a mile to the south. There lies the Attica Correctional Facility, one of New York's most notorious maximum security prisons. Still, in 1971, hardly all of Attica's 2,243 prisoners, most of whom are Black or Puerto Rican, were hardened criminals. For example, 21-year-old Elliot L.D. Barkley from Brooklyn landed in Attica after violating parole by driving without a license. 19-year-old twins James and John Schleich were also in Attica for parole violations, with John's original conviction for unauthorized use of a motor vehicle and James getting caught cutting a hole in a lady's convertible top, aka unauthorized construction of a sunroof. No good deed goes unpunished. And unpunished might be an understatement, because the conditions at Attica weren't exactly humane. The prison suffered from severe overcrowding, with men crammed into tiny cells for 15 to 24 hours a day. Whether in the freezing cold winters or the scorching hot summers, prisoners were permitted one shower per week, one roll of toilet paper per month, and had to work menial jobs that really earned them more than six cents a day if they wanted to afford luxury items like toothpaste. Meanwhile, inmates received an insufficient amount of food to meet standards determined by federal guidelines, and if they violated scores of rules governing daily behavior like talking on the way to the mess hall, prisoners could be subjected to punishments like indefinite confinement to their cells. And, on top of that, aside from the occasional chess game, Attica's men were bored. The prison had no newspapers, few books, nothing to read in Spanish, and only provided magazines like Outdoor Life, Field and Stream, American Home, and House Beautiful. Although, in prison officials' defense, it was just too expensive to provide magazines even more relevant to prisoners' lives like Private Islands, Elevator World, Sheep, and my personal favorite, Miniature Donkey Talk. According to one person who later interviewed over 1,600 of Attica's prisoners, the bottom line was that by the 1970s, almost all inmates, including the acclimated ones, were frustrated. And the same could be said of prisoners at the Auburn Correctional Facility, another maximum security prison in upstate New York. Fed up with many of the same conditions faced by prisoners at Attica, one day in June 1970, a group of black prisoners refused to work, blocked entrances to the prison yard, took 50 corrections officers hostage and issued a list of demands for things like more Spanish-speaking corrections officers and better medical care. Prison officials said, okay, you can talk to someone about your demands if you surrender peacefully, which after six hours, the inmates did. But instead of negotiating with the prisoners, guards proceeded to beat them, six were charged with criminal indictments, and the militant troublemakers, as Russell Oswald, New York's commissioner of the Department of Corrections called them, were transferred to solitary confinement in Attica, which didn't do much to ease growing tensions there. A year later, a group of five Attica prisoners sent their own list of demands to Oswald, calling for improvements in living and working conditions. We hope that your department don't cause us any harm in the future, they added, because we are informing you of prison conditions. We are doing this in a democratic manner. But New York state officials weren't so keen to negotiate with them either, as they knew that would upset the guy at the top. New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller. A lifelong Republican with presidential aspirations, Rockefeller had watched throughout the 1960s as Richard Nixon stole his political thunder. To steal some of it back, Rockefeller promised that he too would get tough on crime. And a Cold War warrior to his core, he viewed rising prisoner agitation as part of a larger leftist plot, just one more step toward the ultimate destruction of the country. It's hard to deny his logic. First, you give prisoners sufficient toilet paper, toothpaste, and vegetables. Next, you're slashing greenhouse gas emissions. And from there, it's a short step to providing quality health care to every citizen who, freed from crippling medical debt, will kill you in your sleep. Hypothetically, 
Still, Oswald, who had a record as a reformer, promised to at least meet with prisoners to review their demands in September. It became a high-stakes meeting for two reasons. First, prison conditions continued to worsen. For example, as the summer of 1971 wore on, anyone even caught with a copy of the list of demands was put in solitary. Second, on August 21st, George Jackson, a prisoner in California's San Quentin State Prison known for his writings on the brutality of the penal system, was shot while trying to escape. For Attica's men, the significance of the death of a prisoner as famous as Jackson was clear. Guards could get away with killing inmates. In solidarity, the next day, black, white, and Puerto Rican prisoners staged a spiritual sit-in, refusing to eat anything at breakfast. With unrest mounting and more visible than ever, prisoners waited with bated breath to see what reforms Oswald would agree to at the meeting in September. On the day of the meeting, they were disappointed. In the wake of Jackson's death, Oswald himself had become more militant, writing to Rockefeller that displays of convict unity were proof that anything can happen when dealing with the kinds of idealists and fanatics housed in our facilities. So instead of showing up to the meeting, Oswald left prisoners a taped message in which he apologized that an emergent situation had come up, one can only assume that he had accidentally double booked himself to have a talk with a miniature donkey, and the only reference he made to prisoners' demands was that his staff would continue to review them. Unsurprisingly, Attica's men felt betrayed, and as tensions reached a boiling point, one inmate wrote to his attorney, for Christ's sake, do something. But by that point, it was too late. Tune in next time to learn more about that bit of skipped history.